This is FRQ number 13. This one's uh, the bonding one. So we're going to look at some Lewis structures for nitrate and nitrate. Uh, we're going to look at different elements of the bonding. We're going to look at some oxidation, some redox, some resonance, and uh, violations of the octet rule. Uh, if, if you want to pause right now, the link to this question is, is in the description of the problem. Um, that you can find one that's a link to all the FRQs and you can scroll down to 13. Or you can go to the website and there'll be a link directly to just number 13. Uh, and, then, and then you can, when you're done, come back and go ahead and look at the answers. Um, so going on, FRQ number 13, uh, it starts with nitrite and nitrate. So NO2 minus and NO3 minus. It says draw the Lewis structures for them. Okay. So Lewis structures, I would start by looking at the fact that I only have one nitrogen in each. Uh, it means I'm going to put that in the center of my, of my Lewis structure. So I'm going to start by putting a nitrogen here. And really for oxygen, you're usually going to be looking at either a single or a double bond. So since nitrogen typically makes three, I'm going to start with a double and a single bond. Okay. And then with a single bond, you're going to have six electrons around the oxygen, giving a negative one formal charge. Um, with a double bond, typically you're going to have four electrons to fill the octet. Um, so if we look at the structure right now, the formal charge on this is minus one, this is plus two, and this is zero. So if I add two more electrons to the nitrogen center, that'll give me a formal charge of minus one, zero, zero, which adds up to my negative one charge, which means that I now have enough electrons. Now technically this will resonate, so really we should be drawing another one. The problem doesn't really set us up to look for that. Um, we should draw some resonance structures, but I'm going to not do that now. Uh, I'm going to look at them in the next part. Nitrate, again I'm going to start with nitrogen in the middle. And again I'm going to surround with these oxygens. I have to make at least one bond to each, and there are three of them. Okay, so I have an oxygen, I have an oxygen, and an oxygen. And then I would start to think, okay, well, if I'm going to put single bonds on each, I'm going to need a pair of electrons there to give me an octet, and then I have negative one charges everywhere, so I'm probably going to need at least a double bond. So let's put a double bond on one of these, and that will give us a formal charge of zero here, minus one here, minus one here, and then plus one on the nitrogen. So, so because of that plus one, that eradicates one of the minus one formal charges, which gives me a total formal charge of minus one, which is equal to my charge my eye. Again, this will resonate. So I should be drawing a bunch of resonant structures with a negative one charge on all of them. Um, so those would be your lowest structures for that. Uh, and I think it's good to know the lowest structures apply to atomic ions. I think it's handy in looking at acid base, why the bonding occurs the way that it does. I think it helps you remember what they are. I think it also helps a bunch of shapes, bond angles, things like that. The shape of this would be bent triatomic. The bond angle would be about, oh, uh, you know, a little, a little closer than 120. Um, the bond angle on these would also be 120. Um, and the shape of this would be trigonal planar. Okay, so that would be an sp2 hybridized nitrogen. This would also be sp2. Alright, so the second part says which of these can resonate. So let's look at what resonance is. Now resonance you may have seen as just double and single bond switching places, but there's actually an electron motion to it. So if we take this Lewis structure for nitrate here, so the answer to B is both. Both of these can resonate. Um, but when you get into organic chemistry later in college, you're going to find that we look a lot at how the electrons kind of have to shift for in order for this to happen. So let's say I'm starting with this Lewis structure, and then I want to end up with this one. So in this particular case, we are locking in space. So I'm saying, this is a picture of my molecule, this is the same picture, same orientation. So I've moved the double bond over to here. So most high school classes will begin teaching that as, all right, the double and single bond switch places, but that's not what actually happens. There's a motion of the electrons. So what happens in this is that you're going to end up with a single bond here. That means that these electrons are going to have to kick out to here. And at the same time as that, these two electrons are going to come there to form that double bond. And if you can see the connection between these two electrons forming this double bond and these two electrons forming this single bond, uh, creating this, I think that's very helpful for kind of getting a glimpse of what resonance is. That's why some other things that might have double and single bonds are not able to do that, because they're not able to shift their electrons around in the same manner. Okay, so you need a certain connectivity, you need the right, you need the right elements, you know, you need to be locked in in terms of octet rule sometimes. Um, so, so that would give you what your, what your resonance would look like. And then of course you could do the same thing, you could have these electrons come in and these electrons come out. And that would give you your third resonance structure. Um, both of them would have, well, this one would have three resonance structures, this one would have just the two 
where they flip back and forth, but both of them would resonate. Okay, in terms of bond length then, that means that each of these bond lengths would be kind of two-thirds single bond character and one-third double bond character. Um, these ones would be split pretty evenly between a bond and two bonds. Um, so you would expect this one to have more double bond characters, so nitrite would actually have shorter bonds than the nitrate. Okay? So then in part C, uh, the question goes on and it says phosphorus can violate the octet rule um, by having 10 electrons. So if you look at phosphate or phosphite or things like that, that's true. And it says what about it allows it to violate the octet that nitrite and nitrate don't have. So when you're looking at phosphorus, you're looking at a, a 3p3 electron configuration, 3s2, 3p3 at the very end of it. Um, and what phosphorus has is it has empty 3D orbitals that are unfilled. And so when it needs to make five bonds, um, it, it has more than these three spaces available, it has extra spaces available. Whereas if we look at nitrogen, and let's assume that just nitrogen and, and, uh, and phosphorus would overlap in terms of orbital energies, which would not exactly be true, um, different protons and different electrons. But, but if we're looking at the two P orbitals, those are down here. And there's too big of a gap there. So since there's no 2D orbitals, the gap between the 2P and the 3D is too big for those things to kind of hybridize, right? Um, and so the answer to C is that phosphorus has empty 3D orbitals available. And the gap for that on nitrogen is too big. Because there's no 2D, that the, that the gap between the 3D and the 2P orbitals is so, is so big that, that really they're, they're too offset from each other. Okay? All right. And then in part D it says, tell me what the oxidation number of the nitrogen is in the two compounds. Now there's two ways to look at that. One is to just simply go and say, okay, my oxidation numbers need to add up to minus 1. And oxygen gets a minus 2. So I've got minus 2, minus 2, that's minus 4. So that the nitrogen here needs to be plus 3, so that those two totals add up to minus 1. Likewise, over here, we have 3 minus 2, so that's minus 6. Nitrogen here is plus 5. So your answers are plus 3 and plus 5. Okay. But the other way to do that is to actually go through and look at the Lewis structure. Okay. So what we would do in that case is we would sit there and say, okay, who is winning the battle of these electrons? Who is more electronegative? And whatever is more electronegative gets both of the electrons in the bond. So the oxygen here gets both of these electrons, pulling that over, and that gives it 8 by the way we assign oxidation numbers. These are not an actual like, scientific thing. These are something fictitious we assign to kind of track where electrons are, especially for purposes of batteries and redox chemistry. So these two electrons are shifted over here, and in my analysis of oxidation numbers, giving this 8, these four are all shifted over here, giving this 8, which leaves us with 2. Okay, so these are the valence electrons that are left after I've assigned my oxidation states. Uh, and nitrogen having two electrons, it normally would come with five valence electrons, which means that its formal charge in nitrate is plus three. And the other one, nitrogen doesn't win anything here. So in this case, nitrogen has zero electrons. The oxygens are all more electronegative. So because of that, the nitrogen has zero electrons available to it by my method of assigning oxidation states, which means that it has a plus five oxidation number. So you can use the Lewis structures to kind of sit there and stipulate what these are. So part E then, it says, why are they different? So the difference, this is a very tough question. So this would be one that, I don't know what they would do on a grading question like this. So I probably asked it a little more for my sake rather than prep for the AP. But, but why are they different? So one of the good answers here is that, is that the nitrogen has a lone pair on this nitrate that is not being occupied by an oxygen. And oxygen will, will take any electrons according to oxidation rules. So the oxidation states are based on the fact that you say whatever has a stronger electronegativity gets all of the electrons in a bond. We're gonna, instead of formal charge, we split them evenly. We're going to put both to one atom. So the, so the electron pair on here gives this two electrons that are not taken away by the oxidation rules saying that oxygen gets all the rest. Uh, and that leaves it with a plus three state. In this one, there are no electron pairs in the nitrogen. It's only surrounded by oxygens. Another good answer is to look at the fact that there are more oxygens around it. Um, and the tough part on this is, you know, how well can you explain that with something fictitious? I would say that nitrogen has more electrons assigned to it in nitrate because of the lone pair.
And I would say that oxygen um, is a sign all electrons in bonds due to electronegativity. Okay, which is kind of the rule behind it, right? So oxygen being more electronegative means that it's going to get those electrons and then that's going to be on break, I guess. Alright, so anyway, the oxygen will get those extra electrons and so, and so that's going to cause the difference in, in this crap. Um, for the last part, I want to go through and I want to look at how you would do a balancing of the oxidation reaction. Okay, so we're going to convert nitrite to nitrate and we're going to do this under basic conditions, which is always difficult. So when you're doing a redox reaction, you want to start with what do I start with and what do I end with? And this we're only doing a half reaction. So we're starting with nitrite, we're ending with nitrate. And then if you have trouble with these, I recommend that you write in the corner what things you have available. You will always have water available to a reax reaction. It's not like you're mixing two solids, okay? And then if it's in basic, you'll have hydroxide. If it's in acidic, you'll have H+. The other thing you'll have is you'll have electrons for the half reactions. So you're going to get electrons from something else, and so, so it's okay to use those in your half reactions. So looking at what's not balanced here, I would start with the oxygens. Okay, I've got two here and I've got three here. So in order for me to balance oxygens, I'm going to actually add stuff to both sides. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put two hydroxides over here and one water over here. And when I did that, I put two hydrogens on each side, but I put two oxygens on this side and one on this, which now gives me four here and four there. So that's now balanced. And now I've balanced everything actually except for the charge. Here I've got three minus, here I've got minus one. So I would need two electrons. That would be your balanced oxidation half reaction. Okay, nitrite into nitrite in basic conditions. Okay. And then the follow-up question to that then says, would this be oxidation or reduction? Okay. Now things like Lilo Langos Ger are great for remembering things, but they're really not an understanding of what's going on here. What's going on is that the nitrite is, is losing electrons when it's converted into the nitrate, and those electrons are lost here. Um, so that would mean that this is oxidation. But the other way to do this is historically, just looking, I'm taking something and I'm adding more oxygen to it, I'm oxidizing it. That's where that term came from. So, so adding the oxygen to it is going to change the oxidation state of the nitrogen, making it go up, um, which is oxidation, going down would be reduction. Okay? Uh, and then justification could be anything, it could be loss of electrons, or it could be the change in the oxidation number of nitrogen. Okay, the fact that that's going up. So that's the FRQ number 13. Uh, you want to check out others, they're on the document in the description. Um, and I'll zoom in real quick so we can get a good look at everything. There are your Lewis structures. There's the resonance. There's my terrible handwriting, and there's our balance half fraction.